Welcome everyone for the deep learning for NLPIC. You can find all information, this recording, slides and further material on the course website deeplearningfornlp.com. I'm Jetz Reimers. I do my PhD at the Technical University of Darmstadt, uh, researching on event extraction in news corpora and especially focusing on deep learning. On the organization of this course, this course will not give a long motivation of deep learning and also not go too much into the theory. Um, there are really good introduction and lectures that cover all the math and we will cover the topic more like an engineer, so we use things that work and we will um, do this without necessarily all the knowledge, but at the end of this class you will have really practical skills how to implement deep neural networks for your task. We have a weekly meeting, so Monday at 11 a.m. the class is recorded and then put on online. There will be some theoretical input and there will be a lot of practice tasks for programming. So given a task, we will think of how can we design a neural network, for example, to do sentiment classification. And then we're going to implement it using Python, Teano, and Lasagna. Every week you find recommended readings and also on the website a long list of recommended readings. Um, just click through them to have a more detailed input on this lecture. So what is deep learning? Deep learning is a subfield of machine learning. And in traditional machine learning, what you do a lot is like human design features. So you have a task, for example, event coreference resolution, and then you think of features which are suitable for the machine to understand the task. So for example, for event coreference resolution, there are over 30 features. So you do, for example, extract the gender, you extract uh, the word in quotes, what are the function words, what is the counts, what is the sentence distance, what is the mention distance, is there a match in WordNet, and so on. And machine learning becomes yeah, just a bit optimizing of the weights to make final prediction given the features. So in traditional machine learning, you spend a lot of time in feature engineering and really little time typically on machine learning. So maybe in most works here, we do just do some hyperparameter tuning. The problem with feature engineering is that it's like task, language, text, and text domain specific. Often you require high domain expertise, sometimes even PhD level X degree, and you're dependent on other tools and resources. So you need a part of speech tagger, you need WordNet and to understand and to extract the features. So when you use WordNet to do some synset calculations and how what's the overlap of synsets between words, we are dependent on that. And the deep learning approach is a bit different. So instead of a lot of feature engineering and thinking what's helpful for a computer, you just get some domain expertise. So you should have basic understanding of language. And then you design or select a suitable network architecture. So that's where your smartest smartness goes into what's like a suitable network architecture. And then you do a lot of optimization of the architecture of the fine tuning of the parameters. So how is your network designed? what are the different layers of your networks. So the big advantage of this is that you are, so it's not specific for the domain. So when you have really good features for some tasks you found in English, but you use WordNet for it, and then you move to a different language where WordNet is not available, <coughs> your features does not work anymore, and you cannot use your system anymore in the different language or in the different domain. For the deep learning, um, in the ideal case, it does not care because you have not such feature, it just work, works on the raw input. To understand deep learning, you need to understand representation learning. So representation learning attempts to automatically learn good features or representations. And in deep learning, you attempt to learn multiple views of representation from raw input, so just given in an the computer vision domain the pixels of an image and it learns good representation so what's a good representation for an image of a face for example 
And instead of mod modeling the problem by the design of features, deep learning attempts to learn by itself a good representation. So let's say you want to recognize the object of on an image. You can think of creating features. So is there an eye? I detect edges. How big is the object? Um, is it like a round object, square object, or star object? That would be like the traditional approach. In the deep learning approach, you just input the data and the machine learns itself um, the representation or a good representation. So it learns by itself that recognizing a face is a good feature for object recognition. Large amounts of data are typically needed for that. Um, they must not be labeled. So you can input unlabeled images and the machine can still learn a good representation. And for small data sets, if you work with small data sets, you can still include hand-designed features. So nothing prevents you to include features you get from WordNet into your neural network. And the dream for deep learning or the deep learning dream is that you work on pure characters and output the desired labels. So you input the characters and you output the sentiment the genre, the translated version, or the answer to a question, which has the big advantage that you have no hassle with pre-processing. Pre no error propagation, so your part of speech tagger gets a tag wrong, so your parser works wrong, and the parser is not able to extract the subject of the sentence. Because you don't have a subject, you cannot answer the question. There are also no inconsistencies between pipeline components. So when you use tools from different manufacturers, Stanford, Clear NLP, Open NLP, there there are some minor or differences. So for example, in segmentation, is the word can't? Is it split into two tokens, one token? If it's split into two tokens, can and not? How is it split? Uh, about tag sets, so is your named entity recognizer trained on the same part of speech tag set as your parser? And often when you go away from English to a different language, you have like, oh, sadly my component is not available in my language, not available in German, not available in, in, uh, in French. So in the deep learning, you in the ideal case, you work on characters. And this makes models easily adaptable to new text domain and languages. So you just take the existing network, which works for question answering in English, train it on Japanese, and you're done. Uh, this is not yet achieved, but there is a really interesting paper, uh, text understanding from scratch or the extended version, character level convolution networks for text classification, will be published on the NIPS 2015 in December. So what is new? Deep neural networks are nothing new. And the first papers are published in the 1960s. But until 2006, training of deep neural network was not successful. So what changed in 2006? Hinton presented a new way, a stacked way, to train neural networks and he introduced the concept of pre-training. We will come to the concept of pre-training in the third lecture on autoencoders. This new concept um, boosted the performance. So before they trained deep neural networks, but there was no performance increase. Also, training deep networks requires large amounts of data. So back in the 1960s, there were basically no large amount of data. Today we can crawl the internet, can get millions of articles, can take the whole Wikipedia, put it into our system. When we have large amounts of data, we need also lots of computation powers. So the machines got a lot faster compared to the 1960s. And also our GPUs are perfect to train deep neural networks. Training is complex, so it's more time consuming than linear models. But at inference time, deep neural networks are often superior, working faster than traditional state-of-the-art models. Deep learning is all about deep networks. And now we cover the basics. So to understand a neural network, you need to understand what are like the inputs. So you have some input neurons, x1, x2, x3, which are real values. 
And then you have for each neuron, you have a weight W1, W2, and W3. And you have a bias value B, so all uh, real values. And then here you have a single neuron. And you compute the activation for it by multiplying x1 times w1, x2 times w2, x3 times w3. You sum it up and add the bias value. And then here you get the activation for this neuron. And the activation is passed through some activation function. Here we call it s. And you get the output of the neuron. The weights and bias values are initialized randomly. The inputs are given from your data and the weights and bias values are updated uh, during your training time. So at the end, the output you get, for example, your label for the task. So what's the activation function and why must it be nonlinear? The, it's a critical, critical thing that your activation function is nonlinear. If you use a linear function, you do not need deep neural networks because when you add several linear functions, you still have a linear function. And the typical example is the XOR function. <clears throat> no linear classifier can solve the XOR function. It's a really simple function, uh, but it cannot be solved by support vector machines and so on. To map it to NLP, imagine you have like two, two dimensions. So you have the word good and bad, and you have not and very. And very good and not bad is positive sentiment, not good, very bad is negative sentiment. And there's no way how to separate it by a linear classifier, you always make a mistake. So to be able to classify it correctly, so for example to classify this as positive and this as negative, you need a non-linear function or you need a non-linear classifier. And neural networks provide you with this non-linearity. And the magic is in the activation function. <clears throat> so this nonlinearity is a crucial concept that gives neural networks more representational power compared to other techniques like linear support vector machines, logistic regressions. And typical nonlinear functions are the sigma function, the hyperbolic tangent function, or step function. So the sigma function looks like this scales between 0 and 1, so the output of the neuron is between 0 and 1. And with a high activation, you get a 1. With a low, with a large negative activation, you get a 0. And then in between, you get some activation between 0 and 1. The hyperbolic tangent looks quite similar, but in contrast, it goes from minus 1 to 1. And there's also the rectifier function, which is sometimes used. Um, it's the maximum between zero, uh, from zero and x. So until the activation, when the activation is negative, you get a zero output, and then you get the linear output of the activation function. Sometimes in some papers you find the rectified linear unit or ReLU. Uh, which are for some types of neural networks quite good. So, which activation function to use? Most people, papers and implementation use the tangent superbolicus function or some mathematically easier to compute version of it. So you find it, for example, as the name hard tongue, super fast tongue. But this is just for performance increases. Um, for certain problems, the rectifier can be useful, especially you find it for convolutional neural networks. But be careful with your input data. The activation can become arbitrarily large, and one input dimension could rule all the outputs. So rule of thumb, use the tangent hyperbolicus for all your hidden layers, changing the activation function. You can do this, but it has only minor effect. So. How does a feedforward neural network look like? This is the most simple approach. You can have the most simple network architecture you can have. So we start with our input. Here we have our three input units x1, x2, x3 with our data. And the plus one is our, our bias. So the bias is always active and it's added to each of these connections. <clears throat> 
Then we have our first hidden layer, L2, also with a bias volume. And then the second hidden layer, L3, with a bias volume. And our output layer with like two, um, with two output nodes. Um, the input layer represent, represents your data. So here are three dimensional data, so it could be three pixels of an image, for example. And the output represents your possible label, so the first label, second label, third label, fourth label, and so on. So the hidden layer represents the nonlinear combination of your input data. So when you want to solve the XOR problem, so you want to learn the XOR function, uh, you need a hidden layer. Some neurons in the hidden layer will activate only for some combination of the input features, and the output layer can represent combinations of the activations of the hidden neurons. Neural networks with one hidden layer is a universal approximator, so every function which is computable can be computed with a shallow one layer deep um, feed forward network. So in theory, uh, we do not need deep neural networks, but there are some functions which uh, cannot be efficiently modeled with a single hidden layer. So the single hidden layer would be exponential in size and really hard to train when we have only a single hidden layer, but when we use a deep network, it's easy to train them. So in theory, we do not need deep neural networks, but in practice, as our training data is limited, we still need it. To, or in deep learning, in neural networks, there's a lot of matrix notations. So get familiar with linear algebra and how matrix multiplication are used. And as soon as you have or recap the basic understanding of matrix multiplication and notation, it's quite straightforward. So in our case, in our network we presented, we have a three-dimensional input. So x is a vector in R to the power of three. And then we have our first weight matrix. So it connects three-dimensional input to a three-dimensional hidden layer. So it's a three times three matrix and a bias vector also three-dimensional for these three hidden units. Then the second connection, second connection layer, goes from three layers, from three layers to two layers. So we have a three times two weight matrix, and we have a bias vector for these two units, and then the last connection is like from two units to two units, so we have a two times two matrix, and also a bias vector of two dimensions. And to compute the output here, given our input, we compute first w1 times x plus b1. And then we compute the activation function, time and superbolicos, and then we get the values for these three neurons. Then we go on, compute the next level, so we compute w2 times l2 at the bias value and we get the values from here. And then we compute the activation for the last one, it's W3 times L3 plus B3, and we get the activation for them. Instead of using the tangent and superbolicos, you usually use the softmax classifier. The softmax classifier, it's a generalization of logistic regression to the case of multiple classes. So logistic regression can distinguish between the case zero and one. But for example, for handwritten digit recognition, we have 10 different classes. Is it a zero, is it a one, a two, and three? And softmax allows you to do that. So how does it work? So we compute the activation for all the output neurons. So we compute W3 uh, times L3 plus B3, so the activation here. And when we have it, um, we take the exponential of, the exp uh, of this activation and we normalize it. So the output can have values between 0 and 1, and the vector for the output sums up to 1. So it can be interpreted as probability distribution, so what's the likelihood that we get a zero? What's the likelihood that the input represents a one? What's the likelihood that the input represents a two? 
and so on for all the 10 classes we have for handwritten digits. How does a feed forward network look like in real? So there's a really famous example of handwritten digit, which are 28 twi times 28 pixels images. So these are in total 784 pixels. And you represent these 784 pixels as 784 neurons. That's your input. Then you have your hidden layer, in this case 50 neurons. And then you map it to your output layer each one um, one node, one output node per class. So you have one for which represents a zero, one which represents a one, and so on until nine. And then you put in your data here, your pixels. So can encode a pixel for the grayscale. So a zero will be black, a one will represent white, and then you input your data compute the hidden layer and then you compute the output layer using the softmax and then you get some probability distribution and then you pick just the class with the highest so maybe the fourth has the highest value. Hidden layers. So hidden layers, how to choose them, how big, how many, that's something you need to do to do optimization for. So where you sit there and you try different layers and you try to see okay what's like the best thing um, you should start but you should keep in mind that more hidden layers will add more parameters the network need to learn and so more data is needed if you have really small data sets you cannot expect to tr be able to train really deep networks and you should always start with a small number of hidden layers so start with a single hidden layer with a shallow uh, neural network and then optimize for it and then you can maybe add second layer and see until you find a plateau so for example for the handwritten digits recognition the, <coughs> the best number are like I think around four hidden layers Typically, what you typically do is like you decrease the size for the hidden layers. So, for example, you start with two dimen 2,000 dimensions in the beginning, then you reduce the size to 1,500, 750, 100, and then 10 dimensions. But that's something you as a researcher needs to optimize for. So, after some time, you get an intuition what are like sensible sizes for the hidden layers, then you optimize. Is it 1,500? Is it 1,700? Whatever. And you can optimize and see, play around, see how the results change. How do you initialize the weights and bias? The, <coughs> the weights and bias vectors are parameters that can be learned during training. The bias are typically initialized to zero, and the weights must be initialized or should be initialized randomly. And there's a paper from Glovot and Bengyu, um, which talks about the difficulty of training deep feedforward neural networks and how hard it is um, to initialize them. But they come up with a really easy um, implementation, really easy algorithm where you can compute the boundaries. So you compute how big is my how many nodes are pointing into the hidden layers, how many nodes are pointing outwards of the hidden layers, then you get a min and max value. So for example, uh, minus 0.3 to plus 0.3, and then you sample uniform at random between this range. And be careful, the this range um, changes on your activation function. So it's different for a tongue and superbolicos. Uh, then for the sigmoid activation function. So keep this in mind when you change the activation function and play around that still your initialization of the weights is correct. Okay, now we come to training neural networks, how to train them. We will present you the way of backpropagation and for backpropagation you need an error function. And the error function is quite important as you 
define what is the network learn is learning. So you would also or should put some thinking into what to define your error function, play around, change it, adapt it to your task. So the error function, in case you have a single label classification, for example, for the handwritten digit, there's only one true answer. So it's a seven or is it a five or is it six? And you define the error function um, from the input x, the weight matrix w, and the bias value b. And it's the value of the log negative log likelihood of the output of y. So you have your true answer. So this is the data represents the 5, or the image shows the 5. And you look at how big is the activation for it, and you take the negative log likelihood. So the negative log likelihood, let's assume the output is 1, it's really big, the negative log likelihood will be 0, so there's a 0 error. When the value is really small, the error gets larger. In case of a distributional classification, um, you can use the mean squared error. So you do not have like a single true answer, but like a distribution. So for example, you have a text and you have categories like this, this novel is funny and it's sad and uh, really well written. So these are like three, three labels and it's maybe 80% funny, it's 10% sad and 10% really insightful. And when you do have such a problem, you use the mean squared error, you can use the mean squared error. So you take what's like the, the correct output, 80% funny, and compare it to your output of the network, so your network predicts it's only 70% funny. And you measure the distance and you square it. And what we do is then during training time we want to minimize the error function, so obviously we want to have the error as small as possible. So how does it work? We use gradient descent. So here you have, assume you have like two, two parameters, two weights, and these lead to some initial error function. So in 80% of the cases, we wrongly classify the image. And then you move, move around in the, in the parameter space, in the weight space, and you want to find a minimum, the global minimum in the best case where your error function is as small as possible. And you can do that by computing the gradient and do gradient descent. So here you have your initial weights put in your data, you get your error. And the gradient is pointing downwards to the like steepest, in the steepest direction, downwards to the minimum. And when you follow the gradient, it's this red line, you will get to the minimum. So the idea is that you are here, you compute the gradient, the gradient is like a navigation system, and the navigation system points you to the to the de uh, deepest point in this valley. Computation of the gradient in Teano is really simple, um, which is really great because it does automatic gradient computation. If you do it by hand using Java, C++, MATLAB, can be cumbersome so because um, not only you must derive the correct uh, function so you compute the derivative of multi-dimensional functions you also need to do this really efficient um, as you perform billions of it and there are really a lot of shortcuts how to do gradient computation a lot quicker which you need to implement so implementing this by hand is quite hard so I really recommend to use Teano for this. Backpropagation and gradient descent. Okay, now we have our input data. We compute the hidden layer, we compute the output, and then given the output, we can compute the error. So how good is our network? And you compare the output to the gold labels, and then you compute the derivative for all tunable parameters. So you compute the derivative for this weight, 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 
and then you can also compute the derivative for this weight, this weight, this weight, and you update them all. So how do you change it? You change or you compute the derivative for this weight, so how much effect had this weight on the arrow, how much was the effect of this weight influencing that our classifier didn't work. And here you compute it, and then you multiply it by lambda, which is the learning rate. So lambda is like, do we, should we do like large steps or small steps? So if we do large steps, large lambda, we do like really big jumps downwards here. Problem is with a large lambda, like we could jump too far, and then we land at the other side of the valley. We do like really, really small lambdas, the pros progress will be really small, so we're just going really slow downwards the hill. One iteration, so we do it uh, in an iteration way. So you give all your data, you compute the uh, gradients, you update your weights, and then you start again, presenting again the data, computing again the output, the errors, updating your weights again. What you need to know is the concept of mini-batches. So typically we do not present all the data or like the error function should be computed on all the data. But this would be like really, really slow. So what we do is we split the input data into mini-batches, into smaller chunks. So for example, we have 1000 images for handwritten digits and then we split it into smaller batches, 100 images per block. And then we pass through all the 100 images, we compute the error function, how good was our network presenting the image, uh, predicting these 100 images. And then we compute the gradient and update our network, and then we go to the next batch, the next 100 images, pass them through the network, compute the error, update the weights. So you should therefore be careful how your mini batches look like. So it would be a bit bad when all your, your first 100 images are zero and the second 100 images are all ones and the third 100 images are all two. So you should shuffle them around. Selecting the learning rate, the lambda, it's up to you. So Typically you start with like a smaller lambda, so for example 0.1, and then over time you decrease it uh, to maybe 0.01. How big is your batch size also depends on you, so um, it's a trade-off between performance and accuracy. You should play around with like smaller batch sizes, sizes and uh, bigger batch sizes. So as mentioned, feedforward networks with a single hand layer can compute any function, but it's not always efficient. So there's a really simple function, the parity function. You have n inputs at n bits at input, so for example 100 bits at input, and you want to output a 1 if the number of active inputs is odd or a 0 otherwise. And this requires an exponential number of hidden units. And so to learn this really simple function, you need to require an exponentially more training data. And with the deep neural network, you can solve this function really, really simple. If you want to have more information, um, look at the 2009 Bengio book in chapter two, Theoretical Advantages of Deep Architectures. And there he discusses it in more detail, what is the advantage of a deep architecture compared to a shallow network. Okay, how do you go from shallow to deep neural networks? So neural networks can have several hidden layers, as we know, and we initialize the weights randomly, but what is what was the failure so far until 2006 that they, or that the community tried to train all layer at once. So you have your, present your input data, then you try to train your, your network on the input data at once. So the new approach presented by Hinton used pre-training on unannotated data. So we first train the first layer, and as soon as it converges to, to something to a minimum, 
you go on to the next layer, can train the next layer until it converts to some minimum and then we train the last layer until we're satisfied with the results and then we train all the layers together on our final task. Um, the pre-training, so it's called pre-training on your unannotated data. You can use it with outer encoders, which are presented in the third lecture. Um, also create high-level abstraction of the input data. And now we come to the last chapter. In deep learning, everything is a vector. So vectors are in deep learning really, really popular and everything is presented as a vector, as a dense vector. So a dense vector is a vector where most values or all values are non-zero. And everything is represented and understood as a vectors, which is really nice that it allows an end-to-end -end training. So for example, when you do parsing, the first step is typically that you do part of speech tagging. And for part of speech tagging, you need to map to some text set but there are some hard cases and also words which are in beak, but you cannot model this in your text set. You know, so you need to decide, is this a noun or is it an adjective? And you cannot model this inconsistency or this, this ambiguity into it. And then, of course, there's problem with error propagation. So your part of speech tagger um, get, got a uh, tag wrong. So your parser is not working properly and gives you a wrong syntax tree and then you do maybe opinion mining and you want to have the subject of a per or subject extracted and it's not working and it all caused by wrong part of speech tag in the beginning of your pipeline and with these vectors we don't have this mapping so as we represent everything as a vector there's no error propagate or in theory no error propagation as we have it in traditional NLP pipelines. So these are the slides from Richard Socher, CS242. Um, please check the website, it's a really good website, it was a really good lecture. So there are different examples so and morphology, so we split it up and say, okay, uninterested, this is the prefix, this is the stem, this is suffix, and in every morpheme in deep learning is a vector again, and neural network can combine two vectors into one vectors to understand, okay, what's like the combination between un and unfortunate. And these are two vectors, every vector is representing one morpheme and it's combined to unfortunate. Same as neural networks or words, they are also represented as vectors, also known as word embeddings, where similar words are close in vector space, so had, has, have, are, here, are, is, where, was, and this direction. Same for syntax, so instead of having a syntax tree where we say, okay, this is a noun phrase and this is a word phrase and this is a noun phrase too, uh, where we have these discrete categories, we, we change it. We say every word is a vector and we can combine words to form a phrase and the phrase is also represented as a vector, uh, which we derive from the vect uh, vectors of the words. And so a neural network combines two vectors again in one vector. And it also works for question answering. So in common approaches, you have a lot of feature engineering to capture word knowledge using regular expressions to, to understand the language. In deep learning, you use the same deep learning model that was used for morphology, for syntax, for logical semantics. And also for sentiment. So you have your one model which works for sentiment, works also for morphology and works for question answering. And here facts are stored in vectors. So you have some information on US presidents like Ronald Reagan, Jimmy Carter. And these vectors are represented, uh, these facts are represented as vectors. So for example, who was the first president of the US? is your question and then uh, Washington is your answer which is represented as a vector and your system gets from 
from the question to the answer by computing vectors and passing vectors through the different layers of the neural network. Learning multiple level of representation is quite quite useful. So because you can have highly nonlinear properties in your data. So this is a picture from Hinton from the Reuters corpus. Each point, each dot is an article and the colors are different categories. And when you use LSA and map it to two dimensions, you get a bubble like this. When you use a deep outer encoder, you can see some structure. So here you have all the accounts and earnings articles. Here you have the energy markets articles. And here you have some legal articles. So you see a lot more structure in the representation. And insufficient model depth can be exponentially inefficient. So when it's not so with a deep network, you can get really good results. So thank you very much. This was the first lecture. For the next lecture, we are going to have an introduction um, how to use Teano and how to use the framework on top of it, Lasagna, to build deep neural networks. Um, if you're not familiar yet with Python or with NumPy, have a look at the links. There you find some nice Python and NumPy tutorials. Thank you for listening.